Um, Jenny works on um, the philosophy uh, of language and on feminism, uh, and she's done um, hugely important work uh, on communication, which has been a, a key theme that's emerging uh, from the conference, uh, and also on implicit bias, the prejudices that we hold without even realising, which is going to be the subject uh, of today's lecture. Uh, and Jenny's work has had significant uh, impact in other ways, for example, uh, on trying to redress the gender imbalance uh, in her own discipline of, of philosophy. So over to you, Jenny. Thanks very much. Can you hear me all right? Actually, can you let me know if you... Well, what did you want can to you hear me in the back, okay? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, thanks for having me here. This is a really exciting and unusual <coughs> sort of event. I'm glad to be part of it. Um, I'm going to be talking about prejudice. It's one of those things we all kind of know about, and it turns out kind of don't. Okay. And the reason I'm talking about prejudice for this project is because, quite obviously, it's something that harms the health and well-being of the community and of the people within it. Um, maybe not all of them, but probably most of them in one way or another, as we'll see. And if we want to tackle prejudice, we really need to understand it better than we do at present. So here are some things that most people think about prejudice. Um, they think racists. Racists are bad people, really bad people, like KKK members and BNP members. <coughs> racists are people who believe that some races are superior to others and will proudly assert that and carry a flag saying it and shout at people and declare this and that's what racists are. <coughs> and each of us, almost all of us, unless we're you know, KKK members or BNP members, I'm going to make a bold assumption that no one in this room is. All of us think, I am not a racist. Phew, isn't that a good thing? And it's easy to tell that because look, I can look through my wallet and there's no KKK or BNP membership card. So hurrah, I'm one of the good people. And you can do the same thing with other forms of prejudice. You think it's <coughs> sexist or people go around saying that men are better than women. Um, and so on and so forth. Homophobes are people who go out and beat up gay people. And yay, good, I'm not a homophobe. I know this because I've never beaten up a gay person. Other things people think. But we're getting better. We don't have to worry about this so much because our societies are getting better already. Things like racism and sexism are going to vanish because look, we've already got laws against discrimination and surely that's gonna prevent it. And really, there aren't that many of these bad, bigoted people left. They're mostly really old. They're probably going to die soon. Bigotry is becoming more and more socially unacceptable. People are being raised to think they shouldn't do that. Um, nice people like us would never dream of saying these awful racist things. And so as racism is becoming more socially unacceptable and the bigots are dying out, we're, we're just going to get to that beautiful world where we don't have these prejudices to worry about anymore. Is there weird interference coming from the microphone, or can you hear okay? You can hear okay? Okay. Some other things people think? They think black people aren't prejudiced against black people, women aren't prejudiced against women, people in general are not prejudiced against members of their own groups. And so as, you know, the discrimination laws do their work, and the bigots die out, and more and more members of these groups get into positions of power in society, less prejudiced decisions are going to be made, and so everything's going to become better and better and better, because these people won't be subject to the prejudices. Sadly, this is doing a weird thing. It's like a good thing. What's that? It's, it's, it's like a good should I move further away or stay closer? Is it better from over here? Yes, it is. Okay, great. I will hide from my computer. <laughs> okay. So, unfortunately, all these comforting views are false. 
they're comforting because they let us off the hook. They let us think it's all going to get better and we don't have to worry about it too much and we don't have to worry about ourselves. But sadly, none of that's true. Okay. So, research over the last several decades in psychology has made a lot of things clear. That almost all of us are prejudiced against at least some of the groups that are stigmatized in our societies. We don't know what biases we have. These are largely unconscious. We can't introspect. We can't look inside ourselves and say, do I have that evil belief that black people are inferior? Oh, no, I don't. So, hey, I'm not a bigot. We don't know these things. A lot of this is unconscious. Even if we have genuine, deeply held commitments to egalitarianism, even if we devote our life to fighting for egalitarianism, we may have these biases and they may be affecting us. Members of the groups that are the subject of the prejudice have these prejudices as well. They seem to result in large part simply from growing up in societies that are structured in racist and sexist ways. And this isn't dying out. So a really nice example of a lot of this comes from a story recounted by Jesse Jackson, who is a very famous African-American civil rights campaigner, who has devoted his life to fighting racism. And he's told a story of a moment when some of this unconscious prejudice rose to consciousness for him. And so one of the most painful things in his life was realizing that when he's in an unfamiliar city, walking down the street late at night, he hears footsteps behind him, he turns to look, and when he sees that it's a white man, he feels relieved. Because Jesse Jackson, at that moment when he realized that, was becoming aware that he held the racist biases of his society at some unconscious level, that a part of him associated black men with danger, even though he is himself a black man, even though he devotes his life to fighting against these pernicious stereotypes of black men, even though he, there's no way you could question Jesse Jackson's commitment to fighting racism. So all of this ugly stuff was present in him despite that. And I think that's an incredibly disturbing thing. In fact, I, I was once talking to a philosopher I just met in Spain, and he was telling what he thought was a funny story of meeting a bullfighter who said to him, when you do philosophy, do you ever feel scared the way I feel scared when the bull is coming at me? <laughs> and he thought, this is absolutely ridiculous. There's nothing scary about philosophy. What a ridiculous question. And we laughed about it. And then I gave a talk on this topic, and he came up to me afterwards, and he said, now I have an answer for the bullfighter. This is scary, the way the bull is scary. <laughs> and I think it really is scary. So I'm going to be talking about two kinds of things. The first one is implicit biases. And what these are are unconscious associations that we have that are automatic. Like what happens to Jesse Jackson when he walks down the street and he thinks danger, and he thinks black men, and these things are linked together in his head at some unconscious level automatically without him wanting it there. We have these unconscious automatic negative associations with the groups that are stigmatized in our society because we're a product of those societies. And often, though not always, these are contrary to our genuine commitments. Now, I, I do want to call attention to the fact that obviously there also are conscious biases, and there also are you know, fully explicit conscious racists. There are still KKK and BNP members, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not talking about that here. I'm talking about unconscious biases. So how many of you have done the IAT tests that I sent a link to? So a few of you have? Yeah, OK. I hope more of you will do them after this. Um, they're actually a large, large, large number of ways that psychologists have shown that we're prone to these unconscious biases. The implicit association tests are just one of them. They're the best known one. Um, what these are are some tests available from Harvard 
that anyone can go and take to find out about their unconscious biases. And what you're asked to do on one of these tests is at a very high speed, you're matching up pairs. You're matching up, say, black faces and good adjectives or black faces and bad adjectives, white faces and good adjectives or white faces and bad adjectives. And it turns out, for taking that example, that most people will be faster to pair the white faces and the good adjectives and the black faces and the bad adjectives. And this is often a horrible shock to the people who discover this about themselves. They were not aware of this association before. Sometimes when people are doing the test, they become aware of it because they find they're having such trouble with one of the pairings that they, they notice. And that experience itself is disconcerting too, obviously. Um, another test that's shown the role of these biases is what's called the shooter task. And this is where what you're asked to do is it's as though you're playing a sort of a weird video game, being a police officer in the US. And if you see somebody with a gun, you're supposed to shoot them as fast as you can. And if you see someone with a harmless object, you're supposed to not shoot them. And it turns out that people are much more, if they've got some ambiguous object, it's much more likely to be thought to be a gun if it's in the hand of a black man than in the hand of a white man. And so they're much more likely to shoot an innocent black man than an innocent white man in this game. And they're much more likely to fail to shoot an armed white man. Um, this test was devised after um, the very famous, horrendous case of Amadou Diallo in New York City, who was a black man who was shot, I think, 50 some times when he was reaching for his wallet. Um, and the police officers insisted that they thought it was a gun. And so psychologists decided they wanted to, you know, find out if this could have been that they thought it was a gun. And you know, people were saying, well, no, they didn't think it was a gun, they were just racist. But of course, what it turns out is that this unconscious racism could make them think it was a gun. So this has really horrendous real world effects. It's not just a matter of an online test. Um, less dramatic real world effects, but still quite worrying ones, come from studies that have been done of CDs. Where what they do is they take the same CD, and they put at the top of it either a male name or a female name, a black name or a white name, an Arab name or a Swedish name, depending on where these tests are being done. And it turns out that the very same CV is far more likely to be considered an excellent CV where the candidate is invited to interview, um, and far more likely to be considered a good candidate for the job who should be offered a high rate of pay if it's a white CV, if it's a male CV, and so on and so forth. It's all of what you would predict. Um, again, this is one of those cases where people thought, surely, surely this is dying out. Um, but there was a study done just last year in the sciences of male and female CVs. Showed exactly these same results that the Male CV was judged to be a much better CV, You'd be much more likely to invite this person for an interview, much more eager to hire them, much more eager to mentor them. And that result held equally strongly for both men and women judging the CVs, and equally strongly for every age group. So it's not even diminishing in the younger people. It's still there present in the same strength in the younger people as in the older people. So I'm going to pause now, because I know some of you have done these tests, you may have thoughts and questions about them, or if you have any questions about any of the other stuff, anything you'd like to raise? Yeah? I, I'm just considering the fact that uh, this sort of prejudice, are you saying that th th these are results are happening in a more westernized world, or is it global? Um, that's a really good question. As what I have seen is that everywhere they do these tests, they get these sorts of results. I mean, obviously they haven't been done absolutely everywhere, but they have been done in Asia, they have been done um, 
in South America, I believe. You know, so there, you know, so it's not it's not just you know the U.S. and the U.K. Although a lot of it is, um, it's not just Europe. But importantly, where depending on where you do the test, you have different prejudices because different societies have different groups that are stigmatized and they divide them up differently. So, um, for example, race categories vary tremendously from culture to culture. Um, not just which, you know, what, it's what stereotypes you associate with what race is, but also even how you divide up the races. And those vary tremendously across time and across culture. So the exact nature of the biases will vary depending on where you are, but this seems to be a thing about human beings, not a thing about Western human beings. Do you have a hand there? Absolutely, that's one of the strongest biases you can get on these tests. I mean, everyone comes out with that one almost. Um, and it, I think a crucial thing about biases against obesity is that those are socially acceptable in a way that being a racist isn't considered so socially acceptable, right? So people are, you know, people won't say, I hate fat people. That's not socially acceptable. But it is socially acceptable to say, there's an obesity epidemic, look at all the fat children, we've got to do something about it. And other social groups, if you said that, you, you know, this is, <laughs> you, you wouldn't get published in, you know, a left-wing newspaper saying that about other social groups, but you would about fat people. So I think, um, I think it's got a greater social acceptability. I think it's also more conscious. I think there's a lot of conscious bias against fat. I mean, and, uh, you know, you can just see this with all the articles you see in newspapers and magazines about how to lose weight, and with the number of people who are on a diet and who are looking at themselves and saying, oh, yeah, fat. I mean, this is, it's fully conscious, as well as unconscious, I think. In the place, they are the lazy ones, the ones who don't uh, yeah. adjust easily, this kind of thing, so. Yeah, so yeah, 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 and people even have, belief, yeah, they even have things that will shore it up and defend it, saying, you know, that what it is is, it's, these are people who eat too much, they don't know how to control themselves, they don't have the energy to exercise, you know, so it's, um, I think there is gonna be unconscious bias against obesity, but there's so much conscious and explicit stuff that that may even be much bigger in the case of that one. But it's a good one to raise. Yeah. Um, when speaking about CV studies, you mentioned the phrases black names and white names. Yeah. I can understand what you mean by white names, but um, I don't really get yeah, yeah. Uh, the um, It was a shorthand, which I probably shouldn't have used. It's a shorthand for the studies which have been done, those have been done largely in the US with sort of typically black names, which are um, <coughs> names like, um, in, in the US you aren't gonna get a white man named Jamal, but you will get a black man named Jamal. Their names are associated with these groups. So stereotypically, sorry, I shouldn't say you're not going to get, but names are stereotyped as black, but names are stereotyped as white. So um, they'll use names like Lakeisha versus Emma. All right, so, and those are culturally specific, obviously. Those are, you know, stereotypically black American names. And you can't 
do that study here with those same names, obviously, because this is going to vary from place to place which names are stereotypically associated with which groups. So that it was shorthand for stereotypically. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's a really good question, and I can look it up if we have a break. I can find out online because I, I suspect that there have been studies done there, but I don't know the answer to the question. But it's a really good thing to look into. Yeah, um, but there's still there are likely to be other, if, if, even if there, I mean, I suspect there probably will still be racial prejudices, but even if there aren't, there are going to be other prejudices at work in those societies as well. Um, well, which groups are stereotyped as good will depend on the jobs. And so the most recent study was jobs in the sciences, which are quite strongly stereotyped as male. Um, but if you had, say, job applications for um, primary school teaching or nursing, it would be quite likely that the male CVs would do less well because those are stereotyped as female. So it is going to be very much relative to which kind of job it is. I actually can't see a clock from here. I'll, I'll give you a shout. Um, <laughs> it's five two. Okay. <coughs> okay. So this is going to have a lot of effects on a community, and I know that building sustainable communities is the focus here. So it's going to lead to unconscious discrimination, and that, of course, leads to and helps shore up the already existing economic inequality. Of course, some of these biases will be just about social class, so they will be precisely about economic inequality in some sense. Um, in a society like ours, obviously, there, you can't have legally mandated segregation in housing. But in fact, there is a lot of de facto segregation in housing, where people like to live in communities of people like themselves. Or they can't afford to live in communities of, that they might prefer to live in. You certainly get economic segregation, but you also get segregation by other social groups as well. There is a lot of segregation in employment, um, with certain jobs more likely to be held by members of certain social groups. A lot of segregation in education. Obviously, these biases also lead to violence. We saw one example of it with police violence against Mamadou Diallo, but there's lots of other violence as well. More broadly, it leads to keeping people from realizing their full potential as human beings, from doing all the things they could otherwise be capable of doing because they're held back by the prejudices of those around them. And even more broadly, what it leads to is a lot of injustice. Lots of things that are wrong and need to be changed. Another mostly, though not wholly, unconscious phenomenon is stereotype threat. And this is different. Um, unconscious bias is how we judge other people who are members of social groups, whether our own or a different one. Okay, so it's the judgments that we make of them, the associations that we have with them, the expectations that we have. Stereotype threat is different. It's about actual underperformance by people who are members of groups that are fought by their culture to not be very good at certain kinds of tasks. And it doesn't always happen. It happens in cases which are called um, threat-provoking situations where they really care about doing well, it really matters, the stakes are high, and something reminds them of their group membership. And there are lots and lots of situations like these. But an important point to make about stereotype threat, an interesting one, is that it's not just about groups that are generally stigmatized in society and groups that are generally um, underprivileged in society. 
It can be even members of a group that is generally at the top of the pile but thought to be bad at one thing. So, for example, a white American men at Ivy League universities are not a group we should feel very concerned about in general. <laughs> they've, they've got it pretty easy if they're there. But if you tell them that they're taking a test of athletic ability and it really matters, and you do something to remind them that they're white, like maybe having a bunch of pictures of black sports heroes on the walls while they're doing it, they perform less well than they otherwise would. But of course, the groups we're going to be more concerned about are groups that <laughs> are unlike the you know, white American men at Ivy League universities. Um, and this will include lots of groups. You can probably think of them yourselves. But I want to make a point about how easy it is to come by these threat-producing environments and how early it starts. So if you take five to seven-year-old girls and you give them a test that they're told is a test of their maths ability, you can dramatically change their results just by varying what you have them do first. If you have them color in a picture of a landscape, they do just as well as the boys. If you have them color in a picture of a girl holding a baby doll, their performance plummets. Because that's reminded them that they're girls, because it's such a gendered image. And being reminded that they're girls makes them do less well at maths, because girls aren't supposed to be good at maths. These reminders are very easy to come by. It could be something like that. It can be being really outnumbered in the room, being one of very few women in the room, one of very few black people in the room. It can be ticking a box before taking the test that indicates your gender. One thing that I find very worrying when thinking about gender and stereotype threat is the fact that before taking high stakes tests, what have your parents always told you to do? Well, one of the things you do right before you take the high stakes test is you go and use the toilet because you're going to be locked in that testing situation. Well, to go and use the toilet, you have to find the one with the woman or the man on the door. So you're thinking about your gender right before going into the high stakes test. And being made aware of that, if it's a mass test, is going to make your performance go down. And all of this is going to affect the community in detrimental ways as well. So there's going to be underperformance by people, leading to even more economic and educational inequality. So now they've got to deal with not just the fact that other people might think they're not very good at something, but in high stakes situations, they're likely to underperform. Again, people are going to fail to realize their full potential. Again, it'll contribute to employment and educational segregation and lead to injustice. It'll also mean that the community will suffer from not getting the best out of these people. Yes? to an environment without stereotype threat. So the way to test that would be to put you into a non-threat-provoking environment. 
to have you doing the same kinds of things in a room full of women or something. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard sometimes to think of exactly how to, to take the threat away, but it might well be that you would do even better. Another way that it can be tested is that they found, there have been studies where they measure people's heart rates when they're in stereotype threat provoking environments. In, even people who insist, I am not experiencing any anxiety at all, are actually showing an increased heart rate. So it may be that you actually are immune to stereotype threat, but it might be you'd be doing even better if you didn't have to fight it. Any other questions at this point? Well, what if you're outnumbered in some sort of test, but you're the one who is supposed to have the advantage by virtue of a stereotype? What sort of performance will we have then? In that case, you may even get a stereotype boost by being reminded of your group membership. So this is something that I, I um, didn't mention, um, but it can also happen. So if you're in a group that's supposed to be best at it, and you're reminded of that, it can be useful. Now, go back to those five to seven year old girls. Um, in the United States, anyway, East Asians are stereotyped as good at maths. And so you take the same five to seven year old girls, and some of them are East Asian, you have them color in a picture of chopsticks before taking the math test, and their performance goes way up above the board. So being reminded of the group membership in that case gives them a boost. So you, know, you take the same East Asian girls and you can give them top performances, medium performances, or low performances, depending on what picture you have them color in first. Yeah? That's a really, really interesting question. Um, it may depend a lot on what they do in those schools um, and how they make you think about this. In fact, it, I think it probably will. I'll be getting some of the ways of fighting this. Um, but things like exposure to people who don't fit the stereotype of your group can really help. But of course, being reminded of your group membership can hurt. So it's, it's a little bit tricky. Yeah? Uh, there was a recent study that was showing the threat, the, let's say, the threat in the employment sector, the, the purchasing the purchase threat. Uh, I think it was conducted by a Greek and a German university. Well, I come from Greece. Now with the economic crisis, you know, we have perceived, uh, not just the Greeks, the, the, uh, the people from the peaks, uh, Portugal, the island, uh, Italy, Greece, and Spain. So the people from this country, there was a study that was indicating they have far, far less chances in the, in the industry, especially in Germany when they go to war. Uh, because they have to walk twice as hard to prove to their employers that, that they are not lazy and they are not yeah. uh, uh, corrupt and all these kind yep. of things they are now uh, regarded as. So yeah. I think it's uh, a huge thing. In terms That's of absolutely right. They will be suffering from unconscious bias. And, and yeah. another point, I think everyone every tries, consciously at least, to discard any negative uh, stereotypes, but we all accept the positive ones. I mean, if the Greeks were regarded as the best in math, I would accept it. I say, yeah, I'm the best in math because I'm Greek. But, <laughs> but yes, but, but this is completely false as well in the other, at the other end. I mean, yeah. we all yeah. accept the positive ones and we all discard the negative ones consciously at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. And it's, it's interesting that you bring up the role of the economic crisis because, of course, that's something really recent, right? Yeah. But really recent things can have that effect. In fact, it turns out that if you put bring people into a lab and you make up some group names and you say, okay, you guys are the glumps and you're the schlumps, <laughs> and you tell them some things about glumps and schlumps, they'll start to be prejudiced against each other at an unconscious level almost instantly. So it, it can be very quick to introduce this stuff. It seems to be something human brains like to do. And you know, there's good reason for this, which is that it's really useful for us to make fast associations. Right, it's useful for me to think boiling water is going to, you know, jump out of the way, rather than thinking boiling water. Oh yeah, that's hot. Hot things burn sometimes. Oh, it could burn me. Right, you don't want to have to go through all those steps. You want things to happen automatically, and most of the time it serves us well that we categorize and we make assumptions and we associate things together. But with this stuff, it can really lead us into problems. Okay. So how do you fight all this? 
Um, the first thing I think is that people need to understand it. They need to understand it a whole lot better than they do. And this requires, crucially, abandoning the traditional picture of prejudice, where we all know who the bad, bigoted people are, and it's just a few of them, a few bad apples, and the rest of us can go on about our egalitarian business. One of the things that comes with that is getting people to see that they're likely themselves to be victims of these biases. Getting everyone to see that. That it's not an admission that you're a terrible person. This is just a part of being a human being. Because we're not going to be able to fight it unless we all realize how widespread it is. And I think to do that, we have to abandon the idea that bias is always blameworthy. That if you're a biased person, that means you're a bad person doing bad things, having bad thoughts. Well, you may be having bad thoughts. But it doesn't mean you're a bad person, it means you're a human being. Um, anecdotally, I spent about a decade trying to get one of the top philosophy journals to start using anonymous review of papers, like the anonymous marking that you're all used to, and deciding which papers to publish in the journal. And the battle I was facing was that everybody would lead to the defense of the editors and reviewers saying, you know, what are you saying? These people are racist, these people are sexist, these people are biased against foreign names. How can you say that? We're just looking at, you know, the philosophy. And you have to somehow move people past that and get them to see, no, I'm not saying these are bad people. I'm saying this is how people are, all people. This is how human beings work, and we all need to recognize that and fight it. Um, although, sort of, to, to get the point across, I've been throwing around terms like racism and sexism. Um, I think perhaps it, we'd be well served by adopting new vocabulary, that this vocabulary is so strongly associated with condemnation of people. If you, if what you're trying to get people to do is to realize that they might be prone to these unconscious associations. You might have more success in that if that doesn't mean saying, yeah, I'm kind of racist. It might be far better to say, look, let's stop categorizing into racist and non-racist. Let's just accept human beings have these associations and find a way of talking about that that will enable people to acknowledge it and deal with it more effectively. So there are a lot of barriers to understanding this. One barrier is whenever you try to convince people of this, um, so for example, me with a philosophy journal, I try to convince them of this stuff. The first reaction is to say, yeah, other people, other people might be prone to this. But you know, they're, those are psychologists who have been tested, psychology students. We're philosophers. We use you know, the light of pure reason. <laughs> and we, we objectively perceive the philosophical quality. And you know, we, we're just more objective than other people. And apparently physicists, when you try to get them to see this, um, they'll say, yeah, you know, other, everybody else may have the, but we're physicists, we're just much smarter, right? So we can get past this. And I have a friend who's a psychologist, and he's tried to convince, you know, one of the ironies of all this is that the leading social psychology journals that have been publishing this research for decades, they don't use anonymous review of papers. And so my friend actually got kind of drunk at a conference and was haranguing one of the editors, trying to get him to you know, switch to anonymous review. And the editor said, you, know, you see, other journals might have to do that, but I understand how all this stuff works because I am a psychologist, so I can correct for it. Right, so everybody has some reason that they're not prone to it. Well, one thing is that psychologists have measured how good people are at estimating their own objectivity, and they're really, really bad at it. In fact, the people who say, I'm really, really objective, are the least likely to be objective. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that if you spend time thinking about how lovely and objective you are, you will be more biased. 
Um, they've done experiments in which they give people an opportunity to condemn some incredibly blatant instance of sexism or racism, sort of that nobody could miss. And after doing that, they're more biased because they're thinking, yeah, I'm one of the good people. I don't have to worry about this. So I think the key to fighting implicit bias is raising people's awareness of how it works and the fact that all humans are prone to this. I did eventually win my battle with that philosophy journal and even with another one um, by teaching them a lot about implicit bias and they've moved to um, fully anonymous procedures now. So once you raise awareness enough, you can get people to change. So ways to raise awareness. One would be to teach about unconscious bias in schools. Um, there are real issues about how to do that, what age to do that. Um, my, my son's school recently had a science week where they asked parents who know stuff about science to come in and give little talks in the 70s. And I said, yeah, I could do something on unconscious racism and sexism. And they didn't want it. And I kind of understand why. I mean, my son's seven. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that might be a little young, but I think, you know, maybe the, you know, 11 or 12 year olds kind of handle it, but, you know. Um, it's a difficult topic to discuss. It's something teachers may be quite uncomfortable with, schools may be uncomfortable with it, so it's an interesting question of how you could do that. Um, Another thing that might raise awareness is getting more and more people to take those IAT tests that some of you have taken and find out how widespread this is. I pause for a minute and see if you have thoughts about ways to raise awareness. Yeah? I, I was just thinking on the point that you said it would be too young at that age, but in my primary school, um, we were in the education system, you're naturally sort of put into groups of, so you're set one, you're set two, <laughs> you're set three. So that so then naturally there's a, there's a level associated with the people who are smarter and the people who are dumber. That's a great point, and I actually have a slide about that very topic. But yeah, that's, a, that's an absolutely great point. But I think this may be one of the reasons the educational system is so sure about when we do this. But yeah, they are, they are doing that, and they are categorizing from a very young age. Yeah, other thoughts? Um, the maths one would be good to yeah. do with the children of the age that are doing it, though. That would be a real good Yeah, and piece. show them how their results change. Um, yeah. And that's not quite so threatening. No, it's not, because they're even learning how to make the results better. Yeah, it's not how I, you know, I, 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 I can understand why they're worried about it, because, it, you know, if, if it's introducing them to the idea that some people think girls are bad at maths, then you think, why, why should I tell them this if they're not aware of it? But of course, tests like this are showing they already are, in some sense, aware of it, but they're, they're thinking about that. Yeah? Is there any evidence about what happens when, like, what you just said, if you do tell them? Like, do they then, once it's become conscious, do, you, do they not then act more on it, which I can imagine is possible? It depends on what, how you tell them and what you do with it. Um, one of the things is that, I mean, people are especially uncomfortable talking about race. And that, there have been studies showing that that's actually extremely damaging. So there was a couple of years ago, there was a study where the, I think it was, it was older kids, I think it was like early teens, and they had short films dealing with racial issues that they wanted families to show and discuss with their kids. And then they had films dealing with other issues, you know, with you know, that weren't, so they have a control group and stuff. And it turned out that most of the people in the experiment just refused to do it. They found it too horrendously uncomfortable to discuss this stuff with their kids. They just refused, even though they had originally signed up for the experiment. They refused to show the films, they refused to discuss it. And what seems to happen to kids is that they do pick up from a very early age that there are these racial categories in their culture. They notice them. They notice people in groups based on skin color. 
They notice that nobody's talking about this. They realize the world is separated in this way, and you, know, you go to this place, there's lots of white people, you go to this place, there aren't so many white people, they notice these things. If they try to say something about it, their parents say, in general, don't talk about that. We don't use those words. We don't categorize people. We don't see skin color. And the kid knows that everybody is seeing skin color and being affected by it. So it comes to assume this even greater sort of mysterious importance that the world is divided up in this way. And kids notice associations. They notice how things are divided up. They notice that. And nobody's talking about it. And they're not allowed to talk about it. Um, so I think actually introducing it and talking about it is really good because the awareness is there even without that. But convincing people of that might be a struggle. So other ways to fight this. Um, one is to stop relying on the standard solutions which don't actually address it. People often think that they can make sure that they're not going to be making biased hiring decisions by say putting a woman or a black person on a committee to make sure that they are free of bias. It's not going to work because people are biased against their own group. So those people that you're putting on the committee to free the committee of bias are likely to be biased. The other thing is if you're putting one on the committee and other people in society are biased against them, they're not going to be taken as seriously as the other committee members just because of the biases in the culture. So they're going to, even if they manage to be unbiased, they're going to have a hard time being taken seriously. Probably the most common solution is you know, the one suggested by the parent who says, we don't see color, don't see color, don't see skin color, don't think about it which is just try really, really hard to not be biased because you know it's a bad thing to do. It turns out that that doesn't work. It often makes it worse. Yeah? Um, I'm just thinking, um, where do you think like, positive discrimination comes into all of this? In interesting ways, which I'll get to soon, but yeah, good. Okay, so things that do work, um, obviously I've alluded to one already, which is anonymizing. I have yet to actually get, <laughs> I've been trying for years, so if anybody knows the answer to this. I, I was amazed when I came to this country and saw all the anonymous marking, which doesn't exist in the United States. Americans can't even get their heads around how you might do it. Um, but you always have to spend like 15 minutes explaining to Americans. I'm not sure what led people to introduce that, but that is a great thing to do. Um, it's made a huge difference to the number of women getting first, apparently. And it made a huge difference in, say, orchestras, which used to be overwhelmingly male. Um, they started having auditions behind a screen. And when they did that, suddenly lots of women got to join the orchestras. Another thing which can work, I mean, when the, one of the things about this is that because the obvious things don't work, we have to rely on the psychologist to tell us which things to do. You might have thought that thinking about some time you managed to not be biased would help you be not biased in the future. That thinking, okay, I got it right that time, I want to be sure to do that again, so I'm going to think through what I did then. That's not a crazy thought to have if you care about this, but that's going to make you more biased. However, if you do the more painful thing and think about some time in the past when you actually were biased and when you got it wrong, that will make you less biased in the task that you're about to undertake. Another thing that's very effective is what's called exposure to counter-stereotypical exemplars, which are people who are members of the stereotype group that don't fit the stereotype. Um, so, for example, it turns out if you're taking the implicit association test, um, the black-white version of it, and you spend some time looking at a picture of Martin Luther King before you take it, you'll be much faster to categorize black people with positive adjectives. And obviously this is a place where affirmative action does come in a bit, that what you'd be one thing you can do with affirmative action is introduce counter-stereotypical exemplars so that you have these people around who don't fit the stereotype, and that can affect the way you think. 
Um, you can get effects just from thinking about counter-stereotypical exemplars or looking at pictures of them as well. Some of the top researchers in this area have office walls covered with admired members of groups that are stigmatized in their society so that they will be constantly reminded of these counter-stereotypical exemplars and be less prejudiced in their behavior. One of the weirdest things that seems to work is stuff that's actually coming out of the psychology department here with Pascal Sheeran and Tom Webb, which are called implementation intentions. Um, so one of the nicest examples comes from a study that they did with people who are trained to be psychiatrists. And in our culture, there's a very strong bias against schizophrenic people. And people who are trained to be psychiatrists also have a strong bias against schizophrenic people. However, it would be really good for them to overcome that bias because they're trained to be good for all of us, but especially useful for the psychiatrists too. So they've been working on how to get the psychiatrists to overcome their bias against schizophrenic people. The way that they test to see if they've made a difference is with what's actually a kind of popular paradigm in the area, where they tell the experimental subject, okay, you're going to be meeting in this room with you know, Mr. X, who suffers from schizophrenia. Can you arrange the chairs for the meeting? And they look to see how far apart you put the chairs. And that's actually the whole of the experiment. You don't actually meet with this person. They just look to see how far apart you put the chair. But psychologists that always seem to be playing sort of evil tricks. But you know. <laughs> um, now, one way you could try to get people to be friendly to the schizophrenic people is to get them to form the intention, I will be friendly to schizophrenic people. And you know, these trained psychologists really mean it and they get them to say it. And they put the chairs really far apart. But if you get them to form what's called an implementation intention, things are different. Implementation intention specifies a particular occasion and an action to do on that occasion. Almost, it could be almost the same thing, but just put in a slightly different form. So you get the person to say, not just I will be friendly to schizophrenic people, but next time I get a chance to be, to be friendly to a schizophrenic person, I'll take it. If you have them say that, they put the chairs close together. I find this absolutely incredible. You would never think of this on your own. These look like pretty much the same thing. There's not a big difference between them. It's not even, this isn't even very specific. It's just getting a chance to be friendly to a schizophrenic person and taking that chance. But this makes a huge difference. And they have found that the intention, implementation intentions can make a difference over a period of weeks. The work on how to fight this thing is still proceeding, and it's in its early stages. We don't know how far this carries, how over what period of time, or over what task. So we know that if you look at a picture of Martin Luther King just before you take the IAT, you don't show the same bias against black people that you would otherwise. But we don't know if that then affects you when you're walking down the street afterwards or when you're interviewing someone for a job, or when you're marking an essay. We don't know those things. This is all still being studied. Yeah? Um, how much of that uh, do you know is due to the fact that you're, when you say schizophrenic people, you're generalizing a group, and when you say schizophrenic person, you're talking about one individual. So how well would it work if you said, I will be, I will be friendly to a schizophrenic person? That's interesting. Um, I think that might be part of it. I mean, we're, we're only trying, in the beginning stages of understanding this stuff, I think that might be a part of it. I mean, they've also found that if you get people to say, I will ignore gender, gender, it doesn't work. But if you get people to say, next time I see Emma, I will ignore her gender, it does work. All right, so it may be a specific person, but in that case, it's actually Emma. It's a really specific person. Whereas this is, sort of, it's you know, kind of grammatically speaking, it's a specific person, but there's no one in your head. Yeah. Uh, do you think the reason we do this is because it puts up the pressure on ourselves, kind of like to not be, uh, to not be biased, kind of thing? Yeah, it may be that this gives you kind of pressure.
sure that this doesn't, that this is so broad and sweeping that you can think, okay, maybe I won't do it right now, but I'll do it later, whereas this is, forces you to do it? Yeah. Um, I was wondering about schizophrenia because it's such, it's mental illness, and you can get such a wide range of schizophrenia from people just being a bit kind of anxious all the time yeah. to them generally thinking that you're dangerous to them, attack you, or bite you, or anything. So when you when you go to well when the doctor sees you because it is a mental illness, mm -hmm. then he surely has a kind of he knows what to what extent the schizophrenia actually goes. And if that person is potentially dangerous, then it wouldn't be a good idea to be friendly to them, like excessively <laughs> friendly. Um, there might be specific instances in which it wouldn't be a good idea to be friendly to the person, but in lots of cases the doctor might not know much about the patient they're about to see. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, you might think, yeah, and as with anything, like, I, I will be friendly, I will be nice to women, you know, some women, you know, I don't want to be nice to Margaret Thatcher, right? <laughs> you know, so there, there are going to be exceptions sure. to this sort of thing, yeah. I, I was just, because uh, I was considering it, it seems almost like it'd be temporary, and the fact that next time I take a chance to be friendly to a schizophrenic person, I'll take it. Yeah. So, uh, straight away I thought that if you have that, then you feel like you're going to be, um, but then after you've done the actual task, then you've done, okay, I've done it. And I, I, I'm, I and then because you feel good about it, you'll then be more biased. That's interesting. Side. That's a really good question. What happens after this? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if they've studied that. That's really interesting. But yeah, that, if you then reflect approvingly on, oh, look, I put the chairs close together. <laughs> <laughs> Although the truth is people aren't aware of how far apart they're putting the chairs. So they might not do that, but they might, mm. yeah. No? So another thing that I think is worth doing that I'm going to urge all of you to do, because I think it could work well for the kind of project you're doing, is to reflect on specific practices. And you actually raised one of these, um, the one that I was going to raise, <laughs> which is the way that small children get categorized from an early age um, as gifted and talented or as special educational needs. Um, and tests are given of the intellectual ability of five-year-olds. And when they do that, they tell you, oh yeah, we know that you can't actually test the intellectual ability of a five-year-old. This is just kind of useful to us to do this. Um, so they'll, they'll have all these caveats. But, you know, so they always tell you that these categorizations are unreliable. We can't really know yet at the age of four whether your child is gifted and talented. But, you know, it just kind of seems like it. So we'll put them in this category for now. But it won't affect us. And the teachers will insist it won't affect us. We'll deal with them exactly the same way, even though we put some of these kids in the special educational needs category, some of them in the talent category. But it's really worth thinking about the fact that, you know, the way child development works, it's really very unclear how intellectually gifted, and we'll see if there's actually a problem with the idea of intellectually gifted. But you don't know a lot about your five-year-old kids. A lot of this categorization is going to go on the way things kind of seem to the teacher. And that's going to be affected quite strongly by implicit biases, because the teachers are, in general, human beings. And importantly, that's going to then be categorizations that get made and passed on to the next teacher and passed back to the parents are going to affect the way the next teacher views the kids and the way the parents view the kids. And those interactions with the kids are going to affect the way the kids actually develop. There are some studies done in the 60s, which for obvious reasons, um, they're not allowed to repeat with the rise of ethics committees <laughs> sort of thing. But there are actually really interesting studies called the Pygmalion studies. But what they did, they took a group of kids, I don't remember the age of the kids, but they're fairly young. They took a class, and they randomly selected some names and told the teacher, these kids are really, really, really bright. And they randomly selected other names, and they said, these kids are kind of, kind of struggling. They'll need extra help. They're not very, they're not very intelligent. These, these ones are really intelligent. These ones aren't very intelligent. And they were selected at random. By the end of the year, 
the ones who've been randomly selected be categorized as intelligent or at the top of the class, or the ones who've been randomly categorized as struggling or at the bottom of the class. <coughs> so the behave this categorization, which is, since it's made by human beings and since it's actually really hard to tell what's going on with a small child, these categorizations are going to be based in part on unconscious biases. And then the behavior that follows on from those is going to be unconsciously affected by the categorizations that have already been made. Because of course, we have associations with the category gifted and talented, and we have associations with the category special education needs. And that's gonna affect what the child ends up doing. So this is an example of a case where you can look at a widespread practice in the culture and see the pernicious role that implicit biases can be played in the practice and in the effects of the practice. And I'm sure, I'm sure that if you spend some time thinking about this, you'll come up with other widespread practices in our culture that could be influenced by implicit biases in pernicious ways. I want to say a bit about how to fight stereotype threat. Um, Things that make a big difference for stereotype threat. One of them is exposure to counter stereotypical exemplars, which also helps with implicit biases. So members of the stereotype group that don't fit the stereotype. So you know you're saying that you don't seem to be subject to these to stereotype threat. If that's right, it may be that you've always had in your mind or always known some women scientists who you admire. And that thinking about those counter stereotypical exemplars has helped you to not be subject to stereotype threat because that can make a difference. Um, it turns out that women scientists are less, women science students are less likely to be subject to stereotype threat if they're taught by a woman. So on that course, they're less likely to be subject to stereotype threat. Um, another thing that can make a difference is reflecting on your membership in some group that's not stigmatized. So those five to seven year old East Asian girls, thinking about the fact that they're East Asian makes them do better at the math test. So thinking about the fact that you're at a Russell Group University. People at Russell Group Universities are not stigmatized as bad at math. So things like that can make a difference. Um, more broadly, and this applies to implicit biases as well, breaking down the kind of de facto segregation that we have. Because being the only one of a group or one of very few of a group in the room is likely to trigger stereotype threat. The more that you can do to break down the barriers between groups and bring them together, the less stereotype threat you're going to have. Another thing that's worth doing, I think, comes from the work of a psychologist named Carol Dweck. And she's looked at the widespread view that there's this thing that's intellectual ability. Some of us have a lot of it, some of us don't have so much. And you know, oh look, the baby seems really smart. <laughs> um, and it's almost irresistible to think in these terms. It's almost irresistible to tell your child, oh, you did so well that you're really clever. Um, but there turn out to be a lot of problems with this kind of ability, with this kind of thinking about intellectual ability. One, which doesn't have to do with implicit bias and stereotypes, but I'll mention it anyway, is that this view, children who hold this view of intellectual ability are less likely to try hard. Whether they've been categorized as really bright, really clever, or really slow, they're less likely to try hard. The ones who've been categorized as slow, obviously, you know, they, you can see what happens there. They suffer from stereotype threat, um, but they also think it's not worth trying because they're not gonna be very good at it. It's more puzzling, more surprising in a way that the ones who've been categorized as really clever <coughs> will try less hard, but it turns out they will. If you, if you have people do a math test, or do, do some math problems that are pretty difficult, but they can do them. <laughs> then afterwards, you tell one group of these kids, 
you did really well at that. You must be very good at maths, or you must be very smart. You tell the other group, you did re really well at that. You must have tried really hard. Then you give them a choice of what to do next. You tell them you can either take an easy test or a hard test, your choice. And the ones who have been told you're very smart or you're very clever choose the easy test. The ones who have been told you did well because you tried so hard choose the hard test. They think, what seems to be going on is they think, I'm good at working hard and facing challenges. And if, if this is hard, it's okay. I'll try really hard and I'll get there. Whereas it looks like what's going on with the ones who've been told they're really clever is that they're kind of afraid of being found out as not clever. They don't want to take that risk of taking a test they might do badly on because that would, because if they, if they don't do well, it reveals how clever they are rather than how hard they've tried. And that's scary and that's threatening. So it's a, this view of intellectual ability as fixed is a problem for that kind of reason. But it also is a problem when it comes to implicit bias and stereotype threat. And the reason is that if you have that view of intellectual ability, you're more likely to be prone to both stereotype threat and implicit bias. And it's kind of easy to see why once you see how it works in that case. You're going to be put more prone to stereotype threat because you're worried members of your group are thought of as not having so much of that ability. It's scary then to be in a situation in which you're being tested on that ability that your group's not to have so much of. And the way it contributes to implicit bias is it's really hard to have these associations between groups if at some level you don't think some groups are better at things, some groups are worse at things. And that kind of requires thinking of them as having a fixed ability level. So it turns out to be much better. You can fight, you can effectively fight both implicit bias and stereotype threat right? and get people to try harder by encouraging the view that intellectual ability is something that people develop through what they choose to do in their lives. If you're working hard and developing this ability or that ability, it's a cluster of skills. And you can develop those skills or not develop those skills. Any questions or thoughts about this? Yeah. yeah. On, on the previous slide, how much do you think the name of the school influences on the on the result of people? Uh, has yeah. that started showing how much like if a school is called Martin Luther King, black kids will do better than if the school was a uh, um, I don't know, another name. Or if there's yeah. just female scientists, uh, people will do better at science. Yeah, it may well be that this, the name of the school could have an effect if there are associations with it. So it could be either good associations or bad associations, and that can affect how you do it. Yeah. Can I ask how we're doing for time? How much time um, it's, it's 22. Oh, okay, great. So that helps. Um, okay. So I've given you some solutions. Now I want to throw out some problems for the, some of the solutions that I've given you. I mean, these are not complete solutions. They're sort of gestures at the kinds of things that help. So we've seen a lot about how it's good to break down segregation and expose people to counter-stereotypical exemplars. And that introduces the thought that was raised earlier. One way to do this is through affirmative action. You know, how else are you going to do this? It's difficult. Um, it gives actually a new argument for affirmative action. It's worth noting this. Traditional arguments for affirmative action have to do with either saying this group deserves a, sort of an extra boost because they've historically been the victims of injustice. Or with saying we need some positive role models to help members of that group because they'll be able to see themselves in this role. And implicit bias gives a new justification for affirmative action that can be added to those, which is this isn't about the past. This is about the present. It's about injustice occurring right now that we want to stop. Right? So it's not just about past injustice. And it's not just about helping members of that group to see themselves as capable of achieving. It's about helping everyone to perceive things more accurately. Because insofar as we live in these segregated societies um, and hi hierarchically organized societies by social growth, we have these biases. These biases 
prevent us from seeing things accurately. We see, say, the woman's CV is less good than the man's CV, even though it's the same CV. And so introducing counterstatic typical exemplars will help everybody to function better by making us see things more clearly and make better decisions. So it's a new justification for affirmative action. Now, the obvious objection to affirmative action always is, yes, but we should be focused on merit, not on what social group someone comes from. And implicit bias gives a new answer to that objection, which is, we don't know who has the merit. We might even wonder about this concept of people having merit after a look at the Twix stuff. But we don't even know who is best suited for this job. The CV studies have shown us that implicit bias prevents us from seeing who would be the best candidate for the job leaving aside social group. Because we can't help but be influenced by social group. So we're lousy judges of merit. So it's not a matter of taking somebody who maybe has less merit, less ability to meet the job description because of their social group. Because we don't have any idea until we fix this. We are not good judges of these things. But, and I think this is significant <laughs> worry, um, which is, you want to break down this segregation. You want to bring people into contact with those who are members of groups that they're unconsciously prejudiced against. Well, that's going to be pretty unpleasant for the members of the stigmatized groups who are introduced into a situation with people who are prejudiced against them in order to break down their prejudice. So there, the worry there. Another worry is if you go about introducing counter-stereotypical exemplars into some environment where their, their social group is very much outnumbered and where they're stigmatized as not being good at the task at hand, they're likely to suffer from stereotype threat and they're likely to underperform. Uh, there are ways of trying to do something about that. One would be to have lots of them rather than just one. Um, another would be to do other things to fight these biases as well at the same time. Another issue, which I always do worry about, is stereotype threat is triggered in part by your awareness that you're a member of a social group that's stigmatized as not being good at something. So anytime you discuss this, you run the risk of triggering stereotype threat um, I think that's right. I think it's a worry. That's why I think you also have to give people solutions for fighting stereotype threat at the same time. Um, so there are a lot of things I want to leave you to think about. Okay. Um, one is how to break down segregation, both occupational and housing segregation and educational segregation. Um, it would be wonderful if you could come up with creative solutions. Um, how to increase likelihood that judgments will be based on merit rather than social group. How to increase the likelihood that people will be treated fairly in your community. How to help people to actually reach their potential, which will involve changing the way they think of themselves and changing the way that other people think of them. And how to expose people to counter stereotypical exemplars. And finally, I wanted to urge you again to reflect on practices in the society that might be contributing to these problems. Practices like, say, that, that don't look to be obviously based on, say, race and gender and class, like putting kids into the top group and middle group or bottom group, but that might actually contribute to these biases. And I, I open these things up for discussion or anything else that you want. Hi, um, I just want to have a question for something you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, at the start of the, the union, we're going through some kind of a dilemma right now. Um, the full vice chancellor, Paul White, mentioned that he thinks that it's counterproductive to have a women's officer. Um, at the same time, we are thinking of bringing on a black and minority ethnic officer into the union and its officer team next year. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, and I'm not talking about the person. Paul White or anyone else, I'm just, just asking you on your philosophical, <laughs> psychological yeah. analysis of um, I actually think 
I think there are really, I've been focused on similarities between the ways that these biases work, right? Um, in fact, there are lots of differences in how they play out in the world and what practices contribute to them and the content of the biases. That makes me think it is actually important to consider these individually as well as collectively. So I think you're not gonna do a very good job of thinking about prejudice if you have one person who's designated I'm a diversities officer or something like that, because there's just too much complexity to this. There's too many social groups that are stigmatized. There's too many different problems to deal with. One person can't handle all of that. These things do need to be looked at separately. Um, so I think you do need a women's officer, but I also think that you probably need officers for other social groups as well, at least ones that have significant constituencies in the university. So I wouldn't say you need a Lithuanian students officer or something like that, right? But I, I think you need more of these people, and I think it also wouldn't do the union any harm to have more people sitting on the union council who are thinking about these kinds of issues, because if you leave it all to one person to raise, they're gonna have a hard time getting taken seriously. Um, how would you say that the implicit biases and like organized biases or the unconscious racism is that how does these two interact with each other? Is for example the rise of ne neo-fascism in Europe linked to an equal rise in, in um, unconscious racism? Um, okay, so it's an interesting question what the relationship is between conscious biases and unconscious ones. And they, you won't be surprised to hear that the people who actually joined the neo-Nazi party show both explicit and implicit biases, all the conscious ones and the unconscious ones. So if you've got the conscious ones, you're pretty certain to have the unconscious ones. I mean, it could be that, you know, that the, the members of the neo-fascist party take the IAT and they're really upset to find out that they aren't as bigoted as they thought they were. You know, they, this could happen. Um, it's not terribly likely, but it could. Um, but then what, what happens, what, what's a little bit more complicated, actually, is sorting out the unconscious from the unexpressed. So one thing that I haven't mentioned that is certainly the case is that the way that people compare the conscious and unconscious biases, as the conscious biases, they have people answering questions on the basis, on basis of introspecting and thinking about themselves and reporting their answers to these questions. And then they find out that you know, they give these egalitarian answers to the questions, but then show unconscious biases. Some of those people are gonna be like Jesse Jackson, genuinely <coughs> committed to egalitarianism. Some of them, it may be that they just don't wanna say it or don't wanna, you know, that they actually do have racist beliefs but don't, don't express them because there's kind of socially unexpressed socially unacceptable to express. Um, so it's not absolutely clear what the relationship is between conscious and unconscious in that way. I don't know, it's an interesting question, what the effect is of witnessing the rise of explicit racism around you, what that does to your unconscious biases. One thing, one relevant study, though, is the one that I mentioned where they give people an opportunity to condemn some really extreme expression of racism or sexism, and after being given that opportunity to condemn it, they're more likely to exhibit that bias unconsciously because they kind of relax because they're a good person. So it may be that seeing the BNP posters and saying, oh, those bastards, um, actually will make you more biased because then you'll be thinking about what a good non-racist person you are. So, you know, that would be one kind of disturbing guess about it. I'm not sure. Yeah. I was just thinking uh, about the, um, between prejudice that other people have that can, that can affect you in the way, like for example, um, sort of the area I'm from, like um, it's very segregated in sort of groups, so it's pretty much white, Christian, um, so, um, and so there's, um, I, I, my mom knows um, my, my, my stance on the way that people act, 
but when people close to my family or in my family have said such things, she's like, oh, don't, don't, don't listen to them, or like, and I have to laugh it off because mm -hmm. I can't uh, confront people yeah. in my family because of the, the uh, I'm, I have to be biased towards them naturally to keep social norms, even though I know it's wrong. Yeah, yeah, so, but there's one thing that you're getting at there is the really difficult issue of how you can change someone. Um, in a way, the conscious stuff is easier to address. And people do sometimes get through with that sort of thing by, by talking about it. Um, I remember, actually, I, when my first days at university when I was an undergrad, I walking back from some event with this guy who was from a tiny town in Maine, his wife, and there was a black man in a business suit walking by us. And this guy was clearly really nervous and crossing to the other side of the street. And I, I said, what, what's going on? And, 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 he, and he was, because he was from this really isolated community, he, he said, well, I, I, I just, I, you know, never, I'm not used to being around black people and the only ones I see on TV are I mean, criminals and stuff. And, you know, and it, was, it was quite explicit in a way that, you know, you wouldn't expect it to be. And I, I gave him a little tutorial on how, you know, not everyone's like that. <laughs> and, and he actually did change. So sometimes conversations can make a difference. I and mean, it probably took longer to break down the unconscious stuff. But I think he was really disturbed to find that in himself because he was kind of a decent person who just didn't know much. And so he sort of went out of his way to try to, you know, get to know more people who didn't look like him and that sort of thing. Um, but it is very hard to know what to do when you're dealing with somebody in your own house who you have to deal with every day who's saying these things. You're not going to help the situation by pretending it's not there. Yeah. You'll help other situations like, you know, perhaps you know, make your mother's blood pressure <laughs> lower. Um, I, it's, it's, it's always a difficult issue what an individual should do in that kind of situation, what your responsibility is. Um, I don't know what the answer is to that. It's going to depend a lot on who you are and who your relatives are and whether you think that they're just, you know, just kind of don't know stuff or they're, they're really set in this and committed to it. Because you know, it's easier yeah. to shift people if it's just a matter of ignorance than a matter of deep commitment. Yeah, because I've, I've had the discussion um, and I've, I've been, uh, I'm, I'm quite active towards it. But it, 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 the interesting thing is the fact that some people are biased or prejudiced uh, th through passivity. So just the fact that they never encountered. Uh, but the, um, kind of my mum's perspective, <coughs> uh, it's active prejudice due to the fact that who she's encountered, because she works at, um, of the secure girls home, so she's not the only people. So there's a certain groups that, she, that she's only ever seen the bad people or the bad people from that group because so she's spending time working with people yeah, who are there's there's crimes. Certain, and, so there's yeah. then certain groups which she's prejudiced against because she's not because she's seen certain people from that group who are have done terrible things. To and people. I guess what it would be lovely is if you could sort of gently expose her to counter stereotypical exemplars, right? Yeah, um, you know. <laughs> There's this program on TV about X. Let's watch it. <laughs> you know, I mean that it's, exposure to counter stereotypical exemplars makes a difference. And if you can find a way to introduce the, those counter stereotypical exemplars in that sort of way, you might actually make a difference. But it's it's hard. Mm. I mean, it may also be that it would help to point out. You know, this is not a full sample of that group that you're looking at. You're looking at the people who've been locked up in the secure girls' home, and this yeah. is not representative. <laughs> And there is a massive misunderstanding of non-white people, and it's so incredibly—it's—it's a—it's like an elephant in the room, and everybody is so pre prejudiced against them because we even have TV shows about all these non-white people causing so much. Um, what country are you from? Russia, <laughs> causing so much um, crime and everything that is—it's because of them that all of these things are happening, and then. 
and this is even happening in the young people. So young people aren't able to kind of broaden their minds because if we see the young people still travel, the older people obviously they've still been kind of locked up in the country, so they haven't really been exposed to the different nationalities. And for example, me coming here, and most of my friends are non-white. And um, when I told my parents that, well, my best friend is from Africa, and I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go visit her in Africa. Is that okay? Like the, the question they asked was like, oh my god, is she black? That was it, like the horror on their faces. Yeah. But actually having her kind of talk to them on Skype, telling her, showing, yeah. telling my parents, showing them pictures, really changed their kind of understanding of it. Now they're absolutely fine with it, and they're kind of trying to expand that knowledge to their friends. Yeah, so that's actually a really nice example of a counter stereotypical example of making a difference. And a, another example of that is one that you see just about every month or two in the United States when a Republican politician who spent lots of time ranting about how awful the gay people are um, has a child who comes out and he winds up changing his position on gay marriage. So this happened last week with a Republican senator. Um, and it's, it's partly it's counter stereotypical exemplar. There's this person they know and love and they're gay. So they, they can be evil and the, the, that kind of changes the view. So this, this does, it does happen. Um, so I, I think that does make a difference. Another thing worth mentioning when you're talking about the way the TV programs work, another practice we're thinking about and noticing is um, there are actually been studies in the US, and I suspect this is true elsewhere as well, show that when reporting on crime, the, ra the race of the criminal is mentioned only if they're not white. So you never call attention to the whiteness of the criminal, and you do call attention to the race otherwise, and that helps shore up the view of who's a criminal and who's not. Because of the, sorry, I, I'm just the, sort of the where press is, so if, if you have a very short title, especially on the internet, and the, the way it's developed, <coughs> so um, I know there's, that there was one that someone posted uh, on a social networking site that they've read, and it was like, shiny eat dogs. And then it was it was it was blurred, it was brought down to that point. And then, and then they put a step back for it saying, I can't believe these, this is terrible. And I'm like, yeah, to do that, that's clearly what it means. It's like if, if it's Yeah, there is also the fact that people want to sell newspapers and they want the click you want to you click on their websites and a shocking headline is more likely to get you to click. Yeah. And you know, racism and sexism shock us in that way and make us click. Mm. I mean they make me click. So they think, oh my god, that's awful. What are they actually saying? And, Hey, I've satisfied them by clicking on that. They can tell their advertisers what the number of clicks they got. Um, back there. Do we make the last question? Okay. Because I know there's more, but you could, yeah. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet who wants to ask one? Okay. of your own family so they can be biased against everyone else. <laughs>